from New Orleans, Louisiana, it's the Q covering .next Conference 2018. Brought to you by Nutanix. So you're watching theCUBE, and there's 5,500 in attendance here at the Nutanix.next conference. Getting ready for a big party this evening at Mardi Gras World, get a flavor for the local cuisine. And one of the things we always love at the show is really be able to dig in with the practitioners. So happy to welcome to the program first time guest, Mike Spencer, Vice President of Hosting and Managed Services at ICF Olson. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a, been a great event so far. All uh, right. Very inspiring keynote speech this morning. Awesome. So. so Mike, yeah. first of all, your first time here at .next. Tell us what brought you here yep. and a little bit of background of yourself and your organization. Yep, so uh, one of the reasons why we came here is uh, my team is up for an award. We've been a user of the Nutanix platform for about three and a half years um, and it's done a lot to help us in, in our position uh, in the marketplace and so uh, part of this is giving a little bit back, and some of it's you know coming to uh, hear about what's next. So. Yeah. so, so actually, can you tell us what do these, what does this award mean to you, your team, and everything like that? Some people, like, there's vendor awards, there's show awards, and yep. the like. What, what, what's that like? Well, you know, I think my team is is really excited to have some sort of external validation that you know the last three and a half or four years that we've been working towards this you know journey towards DevOps and, and infrastructure as code, um, that somebody externally is starting to recognize that what we've done is great and uh, appreciating that work, so. Oh, all right, so Keith and I, I, I think are, you know, <laughs> excited to dig in when we hear things like DevOps and infrastructure as code, something we've been documenting, talked to a lot of customers about kind of digital transformation. Can you yeah. tell a little bit of the story? Bring us back, yep. what was the challenge, what your organization look like, and walk us through what yep. you did. Yeah, so I think initially, uh, very traditional IT team, uh, really managing things, you know, on a per server basis, on a per client basis. Um, and uh, you know, really needing that guy there to click next or to pay attention to a server. Um, really kind of that old adage of treating all, all of our servers like a, like a pet versus uh, more like cattle, which is what we are today. Um, and the efficiency around it. So we had some issues around stability, uh, performance, um, availability, those types of things that uh, really drove us to take a different look at the way we were doing things. Um, and so, uh, that, that's kind of what kicked us off on the journey to start looking at, you know, how do we totally rethink this whole space um, and, and bring innovation in, uh, in, a, in a space that historically doesn't have a ton of innovation. So let's talk about that innovation because, you know, the managed hosting, hosting services, you buy commodity hardware yep. as cheap as possible, you let it yep. run as long as possible. Yep. When I think of Nutanix, I don't think commodity. What, Help, help bring the story together for us. Yeah, so, you know, as architecturally as we looked at everything that we were doing, um, one of the unique things that we did is we decided to look at our infrastructure as more of a service-based architecture, uh, which is very much more of a software development look at the world versus an infrastructure look. Um, and, and, and some of the key tenets in that space are uh, around uh, driving for uh, simplicity in your environment. Um, and, the Nutanix platform helped us eliminate uh, a lot of the uh, specialties that we needed in our area, right? So uh, we are very much a commodity type person when it comes to servers, right? Uh, the name on the front of a server wasn't really important, but what was really important for us and what Nutanix brought to the table was they merged together all of the, uh, all of the pieces in the server uh, part of the stack down to the network stack. Um, we no longer had to deal with things like storage. I didn't need to have SMEs on staff that, that were specialists in that space. Uh, we helped us simplify our, our networks. Um, it helped us uh, manage things through a single pane of glass, right? Uh, and, and we did it all in a very cost-effective way. So it was, uh, for us, it really helped us take that 25% of our labor in that space and refocus about 25% of it um, into really driving forward with the infrastructure as code and DevOps. Uh, Methodologies, you know, Mike. What did this mean for your business? It's funny. I, I look at your website. It's you know, customer experience agency built to help you through this digital transformation. Yep. It's like, wow. It's like what we're talking about at, at this kind of show. So, yep. talk us. What, what does that mean to your company and yep. you know, ultimately your end users? So, so ICF Olson is the marketing services wing of ICF, our parent company, which is a large, large consulting wing. But from a, a customer experience agency standpoint, we we span everywhere from PR, brand all the way down the stack, including managed services and hosting, right? A lot of our clients say, hey, you know what, you guys are really good at designing this, why don't you guys go and run it for us? And so that's really where my org comes into place is not just the, the hosting of something, but also the running something and, and working with the clients. And so um, it, it 
it allowed us to become more of an end-to-end -end agency, right? Uh, it, it allowed uh, our clients to focus on things more important, um, like uh, you know how they were going to change their brand, how they were going to look at the market, how they were going to advertise. Um, and so from a business perspective itself, um, one of the things that it did is it helped enable, you know, frankly, we want a lot more business, right? Because we were willing to take these things on. Uh, we were willing to be, or we were able to repeat those types of things um, uh, with a high level of success. Yeah. So, and how, how do you measure success? Uh, success is, uh, in, in our space in particular, uh, honestly, it is uh, our clients not having to interact with us. Mm. <laughs> so, right? yeah. We're not the sexy part of, of the digital uh, ecosystem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, modernization of data center is a critical piece of it. Clients are looking to you to yep. basically make that invisible. The data yeah. center should be just something that they consume. Oh. As Nutanix has moved, you've been a customer for three years, as Nutanix has moved from a hardware, software appliance where they're selling you the entire platform yep. to a software only solution, yep. how is the, what, what has that meant to your business? Well, so I mean, it, it's allowed us to take our focus off you know, being experts in the hardware space, right? Uh, again, something that didn't necessarily bring value even in our private cloud. Um, we do manage both public and private cloud, but our private cloud space uh, it allowed us to uh, not have to focus any energy there. So, um, and, and really allowed our infrastructure team to become more of a software development team. So that's been a big, big okay. win for us. Tell, talk to us a little bit about the organizational dynamics, rolling out DevOps, what did that mean to your team? Uh, you say things are invisible now, was there a adjustment in headcount or roles or uh, retraining that, that you can share? Yes, yes. to all of that, <laughs> um, it, uh, in its simplest form. Uh, yeah, so you know, a, a lot of people look at uh, the implementation of DevOps being something that's kind of done to an infrastructure team, right? It's, it's designed to make an infrastructure team look more like a software development team or to work more uh, uh, fluidly with a software development team. Uh, and I think those things are, are, are all true, but um, it, it also helped us transform our overall SDLC for software development. Um, there's a lot of things, um, as we continue to, to build skill and trade out skill, right? Continue to move up the stack, uh, we ba basically became middleware developers to where now our software developers for our core products and things that we sell for our clients and support for our clients, um, those developers are now working on purely code and the aesthetics of things, the UX side of it, where we're much more managing the, um, the, the middleware component which interacts nicely with the hyperconverged platform, right, Nutanix. So um, there was a shift in labor without a doubt, right? As you mature through the process, uh, you do a lot of investment in people Right, um, making sure that they're kind of keeping up with the times, uh, understanding the new methodologies. Uh, you know, huge shifts from the methodologies that a traditional IT team would use to what a, uh, a software development team uses. Right, so moving, uh, it wasn't only moving an infrastructure team into that methodology, it was also getting the business and the software development teams we worked with used to us working more like them versus more like the old IT team. And so, uh, honestly, we probably caught the software development team you know, more off guard than, than we did ourselves. So, awesome. <laughs> so th there's the other side of that corn. Yeah. As you develop that skill, as you develop that capability, retention becomes a problem. There's yeah. a natural head count where, you know what, you don't need as many people to come in at midnight to do firmware revisions, yep. do the low level work, yep. but as they skill up, you look around, you know, you look at the, what happens in the rest of the DevOps movements where you yeah. have entire teams mm -hmm. leaving Fortune 500s mm -hmm. to go to another Fortune 500 yeah. to implement their DevOps. Yep. How do you encourage your team to yep. uh, stay? So, uh, to me, it's all about culture, right? Um, it, you know, our team uh, can work remote, they all choose to be in the office, right? So, um, th they enjoy each other. Um, it's also investing in people and investing in their growth. So, it's not always about necessarily the size of a paycheck, it's also about uh, work-life balance, uh, the willingness of the organization to, to invest in their people, right? Um, and um, giving them time to innovate, right? I mean. You know, when you talk to, to the majority of infrastructure guys or even technology guys out there, what drives them every day is not necessarily their paycheck, right? That's a side effect you know, of, of good work they do. Um, it's really the challenge, the pure problem solving of, of IT. And so uh, we give them that opportunity to be able to innovate. All right. 
Mike, can, tell us a little bit about your Nutanix solution that you have. Sure. What you started with, how much it grew, uh, what's not on your Nutanix uh, d d today? So, uh, private cloud, we are 100% Nutanix okay. uh, today. Um, we started uh, with a, with a four-node environment uh, that was really purpose-built around our analytics platforms. We were looking for some way to isolate uh, uh, IOPS from our production environment. Um, more of a standard three-tier architecture. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we did some research out there. This is at the same time that we're rethinking architecture of everything, really kind of looking at, at the way we do business. And uh, we came across several vendors, uh, one of them being uh, Nutanix. It was a very young company, fairly unproven in at least our market. Um, but their message was exactly the same message that we had developed. Um, and so we decided to take a chance on them. Uh, we put them in. Um, you know, we did some uh, load testing between that platform and our traditional platform, and we're uh, very pleasantly surprised to find what we found. Um, almost a 3x increase in, in, in uh, disk IOPS. Um, and so we went live with this analytics uh, platform um, and really did a lot of testing there, right? Uh, and then we kind of started the natural process after we got comfortable with it for about six months of, hey, why don't we, why don't we start you know, working through the lifecycle process uh, and bringing through um, bringing in Nutanix to, to offset. Instead of buying you know, a storage shelf, right, I can go get a Nutanix uh, no, you know, uh, cluster that has the same amount of storage but also brings compute with it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you know, once we started doing that, we started putting production workloads uh, onto the Nutanix platform and seeing great results. Uh, we expedited our journey and uh, within about a year and a half we had replaced uh, all of our traditional SAN and uh, compute platforms. So uh, the, the infrastructure guys, once they saw it in action, uh, once the business saw the results, you know, even, even the financial side of it, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we were almost asked to expedite uh, the process of moving towards Nutanix, which for us it was great because it was less to manage. So as you guys move to the Nutanix infrastructure, mm -hmm. talk about the more advanced services that they've offered over the past few years, specifically the hypervisor. Have you guys embraced <laughs> AHV? Uh, so we have uh, in dev, we are not running it as our primary uh, hypervisor right now. Um, in our architecture, we run VMware today. I'm not probably supposed to say that here, but um, we well, run I'm VMware. <laughs> yeah. um, we have been looking at Acropolis. Uh, really, uh, the way we look at the hypervisor is, is, is a component in our service-based architecture. We are in a position where we can replace that because it's not, it's not an important part to us. Uh, we just haven't had the cycles in, in our uh, roadmap to be able to put towards the replacement of, of VMware yet. But uh, it is certainly something on our roadmap and something we're marching towards uh, because you know, the APIs have continued to, to evolve on the Nutanix platform. We work quite closely with Nutanix on that. Um, uh, they, they seem to accommodate a lot of our asks. Um, but yeah, it really has been more of a, a time thing. You know, there's so many things to, to code in this space right now. Yep. What, you've got the award, but what were you looking to really accomplish this week? Are there sessions you're looking for? Are there products you're looking to dig into so for, for you and your team? Yep. So I, I think um, it, a lot of it was about vision, right? It, how, how, how well does the Nutanix vision align with you know, our, our vision? And uh, you know, like I said, from the keynote speeches this morning and some of the, the new services that we see coming out, um, I think it's done, uh, they're doing a great job. They, they basic, their head is where our head is. Um, they're headed the same direction we are. Um, you know, in a lot of places where we're doing custom development, we can actually go in and say, hey, why don't we acquire this? You know, one of the exciting announcements this morning was around Beam and the ability to do compliance across uh, our cloud platforms, right? Uh, we run today about 50% public cloud, 50% private cloud, just depending on what the solution is that we're providing. And so uh, it, it gives us that one pane of glass. Yeah, um, what public clouds are you using and how does that, the kind of the hybrid, hybrid world that Nutanix laid out this morning fit into your vision? Well, so, the right answer for me should be, it shouldn't matter what cloud I'm running, yeah. um, <laughs> but we are running Azure as well as AWS, okay. uh, just depending on the solution. So uh, we, have, we have partnerships in, in, on both sides, um, but we don't necessarily look at them as being, uh, you know, a long-running relationship because, you know, this is a very uh, this this this, uh, this space is changing at a very rapid pace. Uh, you know, who who knows who the next person is that's going to stand up that we need to support. So we're very platform agnostic when we look at it. When we deploy something, it really doesn't matter if it's on private cloud, public cloud. Doesn't really matter to us. It's just all building blocks that we plug plug in together and and let code do its job. 
So in that model, you guys do 50% public, 50% private. Nutanix has an opinionated view of cloud. Yeah. How does that impact your business and services? Nutanix's? Yeah, their, their vision yeah. versus, the, do they? Well, I think their vision's great, right? Because mm -hmm. it is a fairly agnostic vision, right? Uh, uh, with them being obviously wanting the, the, uh, the, the private cloud side of that, but understanding that um, you know, there is no 100% you know, uh, private cloud and 100% public cloud in today's world, right? It is all a hybrid cloud environment. Um, and that certain workloads are better on-prem and certain you know, loads are better in the public cloud. So um, I think that was in total alignment with everything we do, right? I mean, our, our primary job is web hosting, so we deal with geographic um, uh, workloads all the time. Right. Well, Mike Spencer, wish yeah. best of luck to the ICF yeah, thank Olsen you very team much for having me. Uh, on, the, uh, on the award this afternoon. Yeah. You're a big winner in our, in our books uh, <laughs> either way. Uh, Keith Townsend, I'm Stu Miniman. Thanks so much for watching theCUBE. Be back with lots more.